Hello, um, my name is Paul Russell. Um, I'm Director of Graduate Studies in the Department of Anglo-Saxon, Norse and Celtic in the University of Cambridge. This is a department that has a very long name, but we're relatively small and we call ourselves ASNAC. Um, we're going to be talking to you about graduate work in the department. Um, and uh, I'm going to just start by talking about the department as a whole. Um, we have a master's degree and a PhD uh, degree in addition to the full range of undergrad courses that we run in the department. Um, and uh, one of the great strengths of the department is that, um, relatively speaking, we have a large number of graduate students, both masters and PhD. Uh, currently, this year, we're just starting now. We have 15 master's students and 24 PhD students at various stages over the, their, their, their PhD work. Um, and that does make for a very lively and coherent body of students uh, doing all kinds of different things, but having ASNAC essentially as their core of what they do. So we have graduate seminars, uh, where we have all the graduate students come together and we have visiting speakers and so on and so forth. Um, we also have a range of other events for the graduate students in, term, in terms of being able to give small papers to each other. Um, and generally, it is a very collaborative uh, environment in which people can work on their own particular topics, but they're in a, a supportive atmosphere with other people doing kind of related types of work. Now, um, I'm going to pass you over to my colleague Judy Quinn, who's going to just talk to you a bit more about the Masters. Thanks, Paul. Uh, so the MPhil, or the Master of Philosophy, we call it the MPhil, is a research-oriented degree. The dissertation that you write is worth 50%, and then there's a review of scholarship in the field of the dissertation that's the very first element of coursework that's done that's worth a further 10%. So altogether, the independent research element is worth 60% of the degree. The rest of the coursework is spread over units that extending students' existing skills through learning medieval languages, paleography, and medieval history. So can you tell me a bit more about the range of subjects that students study in the MPhil? Yeah, students come to our MPhil from across the world. It's a unique program, especially from Europe and North America, but as well as from the UK and Ireland. And they come to specialize in any of the subjects we study, any or all of the subjects we study. So our five medieval languages, Irish, Welsh, Latin, Old Norse and Old English, as well as paleography, the study of manuscripts. And as well as that, we have a number of history papers looking at the history of Anglo-Saxon England, of um, the Celtic lands and Scandinavia in the period that we're interested in in the Middle Ages. Thanks, yes. And what do um, ASNAC MPhils go on to do? Um, many of our MPhil graduates go on to do PhDs, either in Cambridge or elsewhere in the world. Others go into a range of professions, journalism, law, management, museum work, teaching, working in the charity sector, a few of the destinations of recent years, basically with an ASNAC MPhil, the world's their oyster. Mm. Um, but just going back to where they come from to, to come into our program, students have either begun to study one of these subjects at undergraduate level or have done a more general medieval studies degree. So if a student is in keen on studying ASNAC subject, but hasn't studied this area at undergraduate level, we recommend they, they apply to do the affiliated BA degree, um, which is um, the degree you do if you've already got a BA, but you're becoming an affiliated student with us to learn our, our subjects. And an affiliated BA student can then transfer into the MPhil. Hmm. Thanks. So just getting back to um, the range of subjects we do, if I can turn it turn back to the PhD um, and to ask Paul his sense of, of how broadly PhD students are spread across the various um, areas of the department. Well, Judy has um, kind of outlined the kind of frame of the department in terms of subjects. And of course, uh, all of our senior members in the department supervise graduate students. So we have a full range of 
all of those kind of subjects. Uh, the senior members have a range of uh, specializations of them their own, but do supervise across across a very wide range, um, you know, so that it's not just per perhaps something like a very specific language and literature, but we all have interdisciplinary interests as well, so that um, uh, for example, I will do Celtic things, but I do quite a lot of medieval Latin as well. So we have a range of uh, ways in which we can find the right supervisor with the right, right range of interests to suit a particular person. Um, and I think that's one of the strengths of it is that and that we, we have that interdisciplinarity, but also there's always other senior members in the department one can talk to about uh, the subject that one does. And what kind of things do ASNAC PhD graduates go on to do? Well, I mean, uh, as you would expect with 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 uh, with a, a a PhD, that a number of them move on into um, academic work of various sorts uh, in other universities. Um, a stepping stone for that that has proved quite um, productive in recent years is the fact that in the department we have quite a few funded projects, and some people move from from their PhD into being a research associate on a project, which is a very useful stepping stone to uh, further academic work. Um, but there's other routes through from PhDs in terms of um, in Cambridge, there are junior research fellowships and things like that. But there's always a, there are stepping stones like that. Of course, some people will take a, do a PhD, but then decide to go off and do something different, and then will very often move into the same kind of range of employment as as other ASNACs do. So um, you always are very employable as an ASNAC, I would have to say. Thanks, Paul. You you were talking earlier about um, the sort of research community that we have between. MPhils and PhDs and also interacting with postdocs and, and the senior members of the department. Can you um, outline a few of the other activities that PhD students are involved in during their time in the department? Yes, um, one of the important aspects of the, the, the training around a, a PhD um, is learning and gaining experience in teaching. Um, in Cambridge, there is quite a, a heavy requirement in terms of teaching undergraduates in the supervision system of the one-to-one -one type of teaching. So uh, PhD students, students uh, are, uh, can gain training and experience in that and be able to learn to teach uh, in, in that kind of one-to-one -one type of teaching, which is a good place to start dealing with individual students and then gradually developing their teaching experience from then. In addition, the uh, students themselves organize their own graduate conference, what's known as CC ASNAC, um, and that's a, a very good uh, way of um, gaining experience in conference organization as well as in um, uh, giving papers. Uh, there is also a journal that's a, an annual journal that is associated with that conference called Questio, where some of the papers from the conference are published so that they gain that experience of editing and proofreading and doing all those kinds of things that are important to, uh, in terms of experience, in terms of publishing materials. Um, but of course, we encourage them to go off to other conferences as well. And so uh, they, they very often will give papers, sometimes in groups, uh, in somewhere like the Leeds uh, International Medieval Conference and other conferences, but in um, you know, group conferences in Scandinavia and particularly, there are annual trips to go off to these kind of conferences um, where the, the students gain experience in giving papers in different environments, with different groups of people, with questions being asked in different kinds of ways and so on and so forth. So this that kind of range of experience is extremely important. Yeah, what kind of funding is available for the ASNAC PhD? Um, well, I think probably the best thing to say to start with, and this is really because the expectations might be different um, depending on where um, uh, applicants are coming from, is that uh, a PhD in Cambridge and in ASNAC doesn't come with funding. If we accept you for the PhD, there is a separate connected competition for funding. 
So there's the gaining the place for the PhD, then there is the funding competition as well. Um, and the funding income, depending on um, uh, nationality and so on and so forth, so that if you are um, a, a UK citizen, uh, then uh, there are funding, particularly from the AHRC, some of that funding is supported from within Cambridge so that you can have funding that is partly AHRC, partly funded by a college. Um, another strand of funding for people from um, uh, outside the UK um, and looking forward, I mean, we're looking forward into a sort of post-Brexit world here where we have uh, funding, there will be Gates funding for people from the North America and so on and so forth. And there's a range of funding from people from outside the UK as well. When you apply, uh, there's a uh, front sheet, as it were, on the application, online application, where you tick boxes uh, to indicate which funding you think you're eligible for, and you are automatically uh, your application is absorbed into that funding competition. So it's not particularly a case of doing a completely different set of paperwork. The same set of paperwork will work, but you need to make sure that you tick the right boxes to get you into the right competitions. Yeah, and it's the Cambridge Trusts too who, who provide yeah. funding as well to overseas and to European students. Yeah. For the, for the MPhils, it's um, a similar scheme. Um, although it's not, it, we can't draw on the AHRC funding as much as we used to for the MPhil. Um, and most of the funding for MPhils comes from match funding packages between colleges and the university. It's quite a complicated scheme and it's complicated in order to maximize how many students can be funded across the university, but it's in fact quite straightforward at the, applica at the applicant's end. Um, as Paul said, with, with the MPhil 2 on your application, you just indicate that you're, you're, um, what's, what you're eligible for and, and that you want to be considered for funding. And um, there's a lot of information for prospective students about funding on the university's graduate pages, if you just look at funding. Well, I hope that's been a useful little overview of how our stack works and um, the different things we do and how we do them. If you want further information, uh, do email us. Uh, I'm Paul Russell and my colleague is Judy Quinn. Um, we, our emails can be found on the ASNAC website um, and we'd be happy to uh, answer your questions um, or indeed talk to you if it would help to have a conversation. The thing I would also suggest is that if you're interested in applying to ASNAC and you have a, a particular research topic in mind, do go and look at our website because you can see the kind of research interests and the teaching interests of, uh, um, of, of us and our colleagues. And, you, and the best thing to do is probably just to email a person that you think looks closest to the kind of thing you'd like to do and just begin a conversation with them. Um, in the process of applications before the application goes in, uh, we're always happy to look at a sort of a draft proposal and make comments on it just to help support you in your application, because you very often have a very good idea but don't quite know how to formulate it. So um, do come and talk to us and come and talk to all of us. Um, we're only too pleased to help. And that, that goes for the MPhil as well, that we're happy to look at prospective applicants research proposals for the MPhil too. Great. Good. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs>